Welcome to Next Quest Podcast, where I ask your potential therapist questions so you don't have to. I am your host, Noah S. Garcia, Licensed Professional Counselor Supervisor. Today, I welcome to the show Christian Feely, Certified Integral Coach and Associate Life Coach, who will be discussing his life coaching practice, Sirocco. Is that how you say it? Sirocco. Yeah, but cool. cool well, welcome, Christian. It's good to have you on the show. Um, Thank you so much. So, yeah. So why don't you tell us about your experience? Yes. Um, so I would say that my experience is multinational, multifaceted, and multilayered. Um, first of all, um, I think a big part of who I am today um, has to do with the fact that I've lived in four countries and I've relocated between those countries seven times. So um, it's been a little bit of a back and forth. Um, and this taught me to every so often adapt to a new environment, um, learn a new language, uh, a new culture. And, and it's something that I've, I've had to do over and over um, because even Sometimes when you return to a country where you already lived, but at a different moment in your life, it requires just an, another process of adaptation. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I mean, this whole process really started, um, or journey, uh, if you will, started since I was a toddler and continues to be a part of my life until today. And, and of course, you know, all... All of it has come with great joy and discovery, uh, but also a lot of surprises, shocks, uh, and a few stumbles, a few stumbles here and there. And mm -hmm. secondly, I think a, another big part of my life experience in general um, is that when I was a kid living in Brazil, I lived a kind of a dual life uh, as I spent half of my time in the big city of Sao Paulo and where I went to school, and the other half of, the other half of my time uh, at our family ranch, um, which we pretty much built from scratch. So I was working the, la working the land, tending to cattle, planting, harvesting, you name it, right? taking care of all the animals, um, etc. So at the time, I was convinced that I would become a veterinarian, but eventually, uh, I ended going to business school and getting a degree in social communications, which in turn landed me in the world of marketing, advertising, and branding, which then became the launch pad for developing my leadership skills, my strategic skills, my people skills, mm -hmm. and consulting skills as well. So, and then, you know, Time went on, and in 2011, uh, I moved to the U.S., uh, and my move to the U.S. was 
a really interesting one. So that's just over 10 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. That was a very interesting moment in, in my life because I got recruited essentially to help corporate America understand the growth of multiculturalism in the country. And, um, and keep in mind that you know, this was 2011, so it was just in the wake of the 2010 census. Mm -hmm. Everyone was trying to make sense of those numbers. Um, so that really opened up a whole new horizon for me. And I became increasingly curious about social sciences as a broader field of study. Um, or, I mean, you could say the humanities in general. Right? Um, I became more interested in politics. I became, you know, more and more immersed in all sorts of cultural phenomena, uh, cultural identity, um, uh, yeah, it, psychology. Uh, I, I started studying um, Carl Jung. You know, it just a whole new world started opening up for me, um, and but eventually working inside a company, which I had done for uh, a very long time. Um, basically, most of my professional life had been you know, working for companies. Um, that started to become too constraining for me. And I decided to, to be adventurous and jump ship. <laughs> even <though laughs> I, uh, yeah, even though I didn't really have a clear path as to what would be the next, uh, the next thing. So, so in 2015, uh, I ventured out on my own. Uh, I got certified as a coach, um, and I can tell you a little more about that later. And uh, yeah, and then you know, I began a I began a whole new chapter in my in my journey. And of course, you know, I'm trying to summarize three decades uh, in just a few right. minutes. Yeah. Um, so I can I can dig deeper into any of these topics if, if you want me to. Well, why don't you know? I know this is planned for a little later, but I think now is a good time. What is a certified integral coach? Right. So, um, I would I would probably start by telling a little bit of, of the story of how I got to, to be a coach. Um, okay. so, so, as I, so, so as I just said, in, in 2015, you know, I, was, I was looking for a new path. And so I really began, I just began researching. Uh, it, it was that year in particular was very, very messy because I was just, uh, exploring and I was just trying to be as open as possible to all sorts of possibilities and uh, I started just reading a lot more than I had ever read in my life um, just you know going to conferences and talking to people doing a lot of self-work in terms of you know you know who do I think I am uh, mm -hmm. how, how do I see myself what are some of my core passions, strengths, um, maybe blind values. So it was kind of a self. Um, um, I mean, I had been through a whole year of coaching in 2013, but in, in 2015, I did some self-coaching <laughs> as well. <laughs> so what's next, right? Uh -huh. And during this process of research and investigation, I, I really stumbled across a video from or by Ken Wilber, uh, a famous American philosopher, where in which he gave a general introduction to integral theory. And I was, I was absolutely mesmerized by every word he said and decided that integral development as a concept um, could be or was really the big idea to which I wanted to devote the rest of my life. There was just something about it that rang very authentic to me, to who, mm -hmm. to how I saw myself in that moment in time, and and how I envisioned my future. Even though it was a very blurry, an extremely blurry vision uh, of of the future. 
So, and of course, back then I had no idea what, what integral development actually meant. I just had a gut feeling. Uh, mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to go in that direction. So um, that led me to pursue a certification in integral coaching. So I had this big idea, which was integral development. I had to start figuring out what that meant, uh, what I wanted to do with it, how, how I could actually put it in, into practice. And one component that seemed logical to me, because um, I was aware of this school in San Francisco, um, New Ventures West, that specializes in integral coaching. And they do have some of, you know, a part of their curriculum has direct ties to everything that has to do with integral theory. So I was like, oh, this, this seems like a good, a good, a good, a good first, first step. And... Um, and of course, that first step took, took a full year commitment of training, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you, you start um, discovering a different way of, of thinking, a different way of teaching. I uh, started discovering, you know, other authors, um, other disciplines. And, um, and again, that was really taking that course was one of the best decisions ever. And um, so the... You've got me on the edge of my I seat. I'm sorry? You've got me on the edge of my seat. I really want to know what integral theory is because I'm not familiar with it. <laughs> okay. Well, um, it, is, um, it is a very all-encompassing um, view of reality one could say right? so one maybe one 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 initial step to begin understanding how all-encompassing is that there are five essential dimensions to it one is called showing up the other one is growing up and then there's waking up and then there's opening up and then there's cleaning up showing up uh, has to do with what is known in the integral circles as the four quadrants. The four quadrants, quadrants are basically uh, or emerged out of the intersection of um, the dimensions of the individual and the collective, mm -hmm. um, and the interior and the exterior. So you have four quadrants. So for example, you have the interior um, individual quadrant which has to do with basically everything that has to do with your individual consciousness and, and self. Right? Mm -hmm. That's one, one example. So that's showing up. Growing up has to do with stages of development, stages of human development. Right? So uh, an easy analogy is think, think of a newborn baby and how that baby uh, grows and evolves uh, until uh, they, be, they become an adult. Right? So, so those stages of development which are absolutely necessary, uh, are also stages, you know, you could draw the analogy to stages of, of consciousness or stages of worldviews, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and again, if you think of, of, we think of, a, of a toddler, a baby or a toddler or, or a, a, a small child, um, they will have a, a particular way of looking at the world. And as they grow up, that... Uh, the of the world will continue to expand and expand, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that view of the world that we develop, um, once we become adults, um, it can continue to evolve and expand almost endlessly, right? But oftentimes what happens is that it doesn't. It kind of begins to stagnate because of, because of many reasons. I'm, I'm right. Right now. Uh, but but if you're deliberate about it, you can continue to to evolve uh, your worldview um, as you know throughout life or until the day you die. Then then there's waking up, which has to do with states of consciousness, and now that's different from from stages. So there's stages and there's states. Right? So states of consciousness are different than than stages because it, it doesn't. It's not really connected to a timeline. Right. And you can have 
different states of con consciousness uh, within the same day, or within the same hour. Right? And you can, you can be, you know, you can be placing your attention more on the, on the physical realm. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as the gross uh, realm or the body realm or even the material realm. Mm -hmm. uh, right? So, so if you paint your arm right now, you're going to be very focused on the on that physical realm, right? Just for right. a few seconds. Uh, but then there's a subtle realm, and there's the, the, the uh, causal, causal uh, realm, and eventually you can also rise to the uh, non-dual realm, uh, where you where you achieve the state of really being one with everything. And this is a much more spiritual realm, of course. Right. And so you have these these different states. So if you're medit if you're a very um, um, serious meditator, uh, you can you can you know almost on a on the by flipping a switch you can you can quickly go from one state to the other in yeah in in, in a fraction of a second or a fraction of a minute maybe. Mm -hmm. And so, so you can you can travel different states. You can't really travel that easily different stages. That's a whole different story. Right. Opening up has to do with lines of the development. And an easy way of, of thinking of, of of that piece is um, types of intelligences. Right. So um, if you're familiar with the work of Howard Gardner, who's done the uh, a lot of um, research behind different types of intelligences. I think he ended up with maybe nine. So you have cognitive intelligence, you have emotional intelligence, uh, you have kinesthetic intelligence, you have interpersonal intelligence, you have intrapersonal intelligence. Um, there's also spiritual intelligence. And so you can, you can develop... Um, like for example, you have you, there's musical intelligence, there's mathematical intelligence, and you, we were talking about uh, Lego building earlier. Right? Mm -hmm. So for for Lego building, um, what you're developing there uh, or working with or practicing is um, there's to some degree you're practicing your your math, mathematical uh, intelligence, but, but you're also practicing your spatial intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's this awareness of what pieces go where, you know, you have a vision of how the whole thing will look at the end. You have an organizing, some kind of methodology as to where, where you start, you know, uh, and, and how the project progresses, all of that. Right? Mm -hmm. These are lines of, of development. Um, some people are really, really good at emotional intelligence, but they, they suck at kinesthetic intelligence. Right? And so we all have our own combinations. Right? And the, the lines of development intersect with the stages of development right? because you can have a very, very primitive um, um, development of, of um, um, how you, you relate to your own consciousness, right? the, the intrapersonal intelligence, for example. Some people don't practice that at all throughout their lives. Some people don't even don't even care or they you know they might not even be that aware that that exists right or that, mm -hmm. but that's on the menu for them right and or it's just not been a priority right and lastly there's cleaning up which has to do with types um, and you can think of personality types but more when when we refer to cleaning up we're mostly talking about the shadow side of our personality types right? and that's a very very for me, one of the newest topics that I've engaged with, and it's, it's really fascinating because one starts becoming a little more aware of what, what things in ourselves we are either ignoring, rejecting, or even suppressing and transferring it to others, right? Or, or projecting it onto others, right? So, so for example, and, 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 Anyone can do, can do a very quick kind of 
check in with themselves with this because it's really interesting. Um, a good way of, of, of kind of catching yourself in this regard is identifying things that you absolutely detest in other people. <laughs> right? mm-hmm. So if you say, oh, I hate arrogant people. Well, what part of yourself might be a little arrogant? Right? Or right. I mean, what like- moments can you find a little arrogance in yourself, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the natural response in those moments, and, I, and I've, done, I've done it myself, right? So it's, it's really like, it's, it can be painful. It's like, wait, me arrogant? No, I'm not arrogant. He, you know, that mm-hmm. person is arrogant. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it's it's a really interesting uh, exercise to go through. So there you have it. This, this is a very quick um, snapshot. I'm fascinated. Yeah, yeah. And then going going back to your original question of, of what is an integral coach? Well, this school that I attended, New Ventures West, um, as far as I know, is at least is the only one. Um, in the country that actually offers an integral coaching certification. Right? And they actually have integral coach as a re- registered mark, mm-hmm. registered brand. Um, and they, you know, that school follows some of the core principles of integral theory, uh, even though it doesn't go, because integral theory can be a lifelong study. Right? It's not something that you can just during a year, you can get some right. it, um, and maybe go a little deeper into some aspects of it, but not all of it because it's just too vast. Um, but what integral coaching in particular tries to uh, accomplish is prepare people to work with clients um, in by looking at clients as whole human beings, right? not, not, just as, not, not just as parts of human beings. Right? So if, if a client comes in with a particular issue or problem or struggle, um, that is awesome because that, that offers a window um, of opportunity or an opening, as we call it. And it's, it's a good way of starting the conversation. However, the methodology of integral coaching, what it attempts to do is really work with a person and not with the problem, right? So that's an important distinction because oftentimes behind the problem, there, there's a number of things that might be going on, right? That um, the client have, has, may, have, may, may not have seen yet. Right? Um, so, so we work with the whole human being and not, not the issue. Would you say that that's maybe even an important distinction between what therapy is and what coaching is, is working with the person and not the problem? Would you say that's a good differentiator? Um, I had never thought of it in those terms, but I think you're, you're onto something. There, there's clearly some overlapping um, mm-hmm. therapy and, and coaching, as, as you might expect. Right. And, and both, both disciplines involve a lot of active listening, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we may also have some of the same tools in our toolkit, right? coaches and therapists. So for example, the Enneagram is a fantastic personality assessment and development tool that is equally useful to both coaches and therapists. Right. right. So Betsy, my partner, is a therapist and she uses the Enneagram. And we've actually attended Enneagram courses together. Um, but we, we might apply you know, the tool slightly, in slightly different ways. Right? So I, I would say a big difference is that therapy focuses quite a bit on where the client or patient, depending on, on what nomenclature uh, people prefer, where the client is coming from. And coaching focuses, focuses more on where the client wants to go. Mm-hmm. And that, that would be a, a relatively good way of, of looking at it. Also, 
coaching is mostly about practice and development, at least the, the type of coaching that I, that, that I, um, you know, that I practice. <laughs> Therapy requires, tends to require more in-depth work with trauma, with recovery, uh, and risk mitigation. I don't, as a coach, I don't really deal a lot with risk mitigation. Like I don't, I don't need to be ever on call because I have a client who is having suicidal thoughts. You know? Right, right. If the client is at yeah. that level, I will be the first one to refer that individual to for therapy right? because I cannot work on the, the on the developmental aspect of the person uh, unless the person has a healthy, relatively stable baseline. Right? Mm -hmm. So one area I think is really quite interesting is addiction, right? Because therapists, um, at least in my perception, you can correct me if I'm uh, off the mark here, but therapists tend to deal with the more traditional definition of, of addiction, which involves, you know, oftentimes substance abuse, and it involves, you know, certain triggers behind that substance abuse. And also therapists have to, have to get a, very involved with the potential harmful effects of mm -hmm. what behavior is, 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 is involved here. Um, this, this kind of addiction is often in plain sight and it involves um, some clear physical behavior, including, you know, potentially including forms of self-harm. Coaches, uh, at least in my experience, tend to deal with other types of addiction, um, which people are often not even aware of. Um, so for example, I mean, it has to do with our attachment to certain beliefs, certain ideas, certain narratives, um, certain ways, certain ways of, of approaching things or relating to other people that in many cases may have served us well in the past, but now are preventing us from, from moving on, right? Or, or growing or expanding uh, any further, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and I say that it's a type of addiction uh, because if, for example, um, you know, one, if, if you see yourself as, let's say, a powerful person, right? You have a, a particular relationship with power, right? And you may have embodied power in particular ways. I mean, you've, you've, carried, out, you've carried out your life, maybe most of your life, with that embodiment of power, right? And it may have served you very well um, when, when you were a kid, and um, like, let's say you lived in a tough neighborhood right? mm -hmm. and you had to, you have to be tough. You have to be tough to survive in that neighborhood or, or to, or to get around, right. And, or to, you know, get your way. And, and you kind of grew up with that. It becomes kind of a life narrative, right. That you carry on into your work environment when you get a job or you're working with a company and um, whatever, whatever job that might be. Right. And it becomes just a way of looking at the world through the lens of power, right. And through the lens of I am powerful. So mm -hmm. no one, no one there mess with me or else. Right. So of course there's a lot of positive aspects of feeling powerful, acting powerfully, um, but it can also have some pathologies attached to it. Right? And eventually that will catch up with you. If, if, you're, if you don't, if you lose sight of how to modulate that. Right? Um, so, I mean, if this is not the best, probably maybe not the best comparison, but you can think of a, um, you can think of sport therapy and a sports coach, right? Mm -hmm. so if you have uh, an injury, 
uh, or if, if, if you have identified a particular weakness, let's say you have one leg that is you know, uh, 20% weaker than the other leg, um, or again, if you have an injury or if, you, know, had, you had an accident, um, you'll, you'll, you'll seek out a, a sports therapist right, to get you back um, on, on two legs or get you back in, in, in full function. Um, a sports coach um, has plays a you know has a different role. A mm -hmm. Coach will, will will have more of a um, they will orient uh, an athlete or a team right, uh, in in ways that they can excel in whatever game or mm -hmm. or discipline they're playing. So, but that it, it it again, you know, thinking of the baseline, right? The, there needs to be for for a player, an athlete, or a team to to be able to perform well and to win games or win competitions. Uh, they need to be at a, at a certain level of um, health and just basic proficiency and skill to then be able to take it to the next level. Right? That, that yeah, kind of I think. Level. That's a good comparison. I, think, it is? I think that that highlights, I think, the differences. Because like when I sat down to uh, on my website for my new coaching and consulting practice, Open World Coaching and Consulting, um, which can, the website is www.openworldcc.com. Um, I sat down to write out what I thought the differences between coaching and therapy are because I, I want them to be two completely delineated things and experiences, right? So what I came up with is that therapy focuses on the why certain behavioral patterns may occur, right? Whereas coaching focuses more on like the how of working toward a goal. And Therapy analyzes the past as a tool for understanding present behaviors, while coaching, fo the focus is on the present and the future. Mm -hmm. um, and while therapy, you know, diagnosis, diagnoses, treats, and focuses on mental health issues, um, like trauma or family of origin issues, um, coaching focuses more on individual actions and results. Um, again, going back to the how, right? Yeah. Um, and then therapy helps handle emotions from problems or stressors, whereas coaching helps uh, define goals, formulate plans, and utilize the client's strengths and skills in meeting the goal. Um, providing accountability for progress, providing structure and encouragement and support in that growth. Um, and I would say coaching is more solution focused, whereas therapy is more problem focused, kind of like what we said earlier, like coaching is working with the person and not the problem. Um, and of course, like, of course, you know, coaching, doesn't accept insurance because, you know, insurance companies wouldn't like that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 it's when I first embarked on the idea of coaching, like a couple of years ago, it, it wasn't very clear to me the differences. But when I sat down and thought about it and did a little bit of research, like those those things were what became apparent to me in terms of the differences between the two. Yeah, everything that you just said makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure I would be too strict about the distinction or separation between the why and the how. Yeah. However, uh, because I mean, I, I do work a lot with the why and the where and the what <laughs> and the how. Right, but your uh, answer is going to be different than a therapist's yeah, answer. I think one, one really valid point um, is we... Um, 
as coaches work a lot with desired outcomes, right? So, so at the at the start of any coaching program, we're we're kind of co-creating with the client. Okay, what? How how do you envision the the outcome of this? Right? Like, mm-hmm. if, uh, let's say we work together for X number of months or X month X number of sessions. What do you anticipate, or what would you like to see happening as a result of that? And and when we have that conversation, we're really talking about observable behaviors, right? So, so I mean, some of it is, you know, going back to the interior exterior uh, idea of uh, you know, it's a core um, principle of of integral. Um, some of it is yes. How how do you see yourself now after having gone through the coaching program? Um, what what has shifted for you internally? Mm-hmm. And at the same time, um, what what how how have your behaviors shifted? Or in the best case scenario, how are others perceiving that shift? Right. So. So one of the best uh, possible outcomes of any coaching program is a third party actually making an observation either to the coach or to the, to the coachee themselves about, hey, I've noticed that you're much calmer or you're less reactive. You know, when, when let's say you're in a meeting, you know, before you used to be really reactive and people would say something that... Um, seem to be in opposition to what you were proposing and now you're like much more willing to engage in a healthy dialogue, right? So when, when uh, the coachee starts getting that kind of feedback from peers or friends or family members, that's when, and sometimes it happens during the coaching program, right? Like halfway, they, start, they already start receiving some kind of feedback it can be spontaneous or they can actually like, seek it out. But when they start getting that kind of feedback, it really encourages, it encourages them mm-hmm. to, to keep going, right? Or it validates their, their decision to have, have sought out coaching to begin with, right? They're like, oh, this is actually having an impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's, it's really interesting. And I think... I'm glad we're having this conversation because, um, you know, I think that therapists and coaches have disagreements all the time about what the difference is and what this should be and what that should be. Um, you know, I think it, what it boils down to is it's a bit of a a paradigm shift, um, you know, from therapy to coaching. Um, I think they, the outcome is what we want is to be the same. We want to help somebody. Um, you know, I just think that the route of getting there differs. Right. And, and the there also differs. Because therapy goals are going to look a lot different than coaching goals, right? Yes, most likely, yes, absolutely. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you for embarking on that with me. Um, So you're also an associate certified coach. Is that through, is it ICF? Yes. So so I have... I mean, you could say that I have two certifications. Mm-hmm. Uh, the integral coach certification is through the coaching school that I attended uh, in the Bay Area. And the ICF certification, um, which I, I have the Associate, associate Certified uh, Coach uh, uh, credential, uh, that is through the International Coaching uh, Federation. That's an international organ that kind of oversees, um, you know, the code of ethics of coaching mm-hmm. and 
set of competencies that coaches need to have. So you need to actually pass a test and submit a number of documents to, so that they, they give you that credential. Too legit to quit. Um, <laughs> that just popped into my head. I don't know why. Just being silly. Um, okay. So by, I mean, for all intents and purposes, like you're a certified coach. <laughs> yes, but it's, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing process, right? So because, right. Uh, the ICF certification is only if I've had it for a few years. Mm -hmm. You need to either renew or apply for a, a, a higher uh, level credential. Mm -hmm. The integral coaching uh, certification is really only valid for a year, and it's a rolling year, right? So every year I need to re... Um, I need to That's exhausting. Work. I need to do some form of, um, you know, continuous education um, to, to get recertified uh, and to be able to, to, to use or claim the, the title of integral. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, it's, 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 I don't find it exhausting because um, I, I love learning and so for me, I would just forget. <laughs> at some point, uh, at some point, I made the decision that this was going to be um, a a, a long term bet, and, right? And I want to, I want to, I want to continue uh, supporting people and groups and major organizations but definitely society at large and with whatever tools I have at my disposal. So this is, this is a really long-term project for me uh, until mm -hmm. the day I drop dead. And, I hear uh, that. and um, I, I, you know, I, and I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very restless. So I'm constantly on the lookout. I mean, I do, I need to submit one, uh, at least one uh, training, uh, report that I did that year that you know, qualifies for me to get recertified. But the reality is that I'm doing a lot more than that on my own. Uh, right. So, um, so it's a, it's it's part of what I it's part it's part of the satisfaction that I get that I get of of life. To be honest, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm right there with you. Okay, we're well, going back to the beginning questions. Um, so at your practice, do you have a sliding scale? Not in a traditional sense. Um, the, the nature of my work is, is pretty diverse and, mm -hmm. and I do have different compensation arrangements with my clients. For starters, um, working with individuals is not the same as working with teams. Right. And, and I, I do both. Right. And I also offer different things. You know, sometimes it's coaching, sometimes it's training, sometimes it's consulting. And, uh, and for me, there's a clear, you know, a clear distinction between those. And it also impacts the, you know, the, the fee structure. And um, so I, use a, I do use a basic rate card just to help me orient myself when, when, I'm, um, when I'm thinking about how much I should charge for a particular engagement. Um, but in the end, I really focus on what I, what I think is fair for my clients and fair for myself. Mm -hmm. It really depends on, like if it, is, if it is individual coaching, there's not a whole lot of variation there. Mm -hmm. uh, except there is a difference if, if a client approaches me on their own and they're going to pay for it and it's just an individual, you know, just a one-on-one -on -one relationship, uh, that's one kind of conversation. And, but if an organization reaches out to me and wants me to coach a number of people within that organization or institution, then that's a different conversation. 
Um, and then, you know, there's always some negotiation involved. Uh, so, I, um, so, so yes, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty flexible. Uh, sometimes I charge by the hour, but other times I charge based on what I understand the market value is for right, that. Right. Right? So if I'm doing a course, a workshop, um, uh, I'm looking at that as um, a, you know, people who take the course are going to get a learning experience out of that and they're going to be empowered with, hopefully empowered with a, a set of tools that will make them better in whatever, you know, whatever field they, they yeah. want. Uh, so that, that has a value attached to it. Right? Uh, so you sign up for the course, you sign up for the, for the workshop, you get that value out of it and you apply that value in, in, your, in your future. Um, and, and that to me has a very different set of considerations when I'm negotiating, negotiating the contract. Absolutely, and, yeah. You know, an individual approaching me on, on their own and saying, hey, I'm looking for, you know, I'm going through this phase in my life and I feel like I need, I need some kind of support. So that's a very different, it's a very different arrangement. And the coaching, that kind of coaching has more of a predetermined structure to it, a structure mm -hmm. to it, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, when I'm doing work with organizations, it's really much more customized. It's, okay, what, what do you need? What are you looking to get out of this? How many people are going to participate? What does the timeline, timeline look like? So... So I have to structure that proposal in a very, very different, and well, in a very customized way. Right. right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Okay. Um, do you have weekend or evening appointments? You know, when I decided to ditch the so-called nine to six work, work schedule, um, uh, it was up to me to decide how I wanted to split my time. Um, and I don't, I don't mind doing work on weekends. I actually spend a, you know, several hours a weekend um, working, what I consider work. But I normally don't do appointments on weekends. So I try to, to set that time uh, aside to, to write, to study, to read, um, and you know, also to be outdoors and you know, be with, spend time with Betsy and and Luna the cat and <laughs> so, yeah. she needs your attention too yeah and yeah did you ask about evenings as well yeah uh, yeah evenings um, I um, no I, I would say evenings I really try to save them I, I save that time to relax to have dinner uh, to be with Betsy, and we usually end up watching a movie or a documentary or a series. Uh, and come come ten or ten thirty at night, I am ready to call it a you know call it a call it a day, <laughs> go to bed. Uh, okay. So so evenings are reserved to unwind and self care and yeah, self -care. people in your life. Right. Um. You, you kind of briefly touched on this earlier, but what drew you to being a life coach? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny. I often reflect on that and I, I still don't have like a, a very organized or packaged way of, of answering it. Um, you don't need one. I, one. One part of it is that I like to think of myself as a recovering ad man <laughs> because I'm <laughs> an advertiser for many years. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm glad I don't anymore. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, the whole world of, I have a love and hate with the, the world of business and brands and, and marketing and all that because there's some of it is still appealing to me from because mm -hmm. when you think of how people how people interact with companies and, and brands mm -hmm. there's a there's a lot of psychology there that mm -hmm. there's a lot of 
storytelling and creativity. And so that, that part of human behavior and, and just human evolution is, is really continues to be very appealing to me. And, um, and I love symbols. I love, um, I just love everything that has to do with um, symbolic or abstract thought. Um, I, I love brands, you know, we were talking about Lego earlier and Lego is absolutely one of my favorite brands and I, I respect the company tremendously. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, but seriously for me, uh, you know, I, because of my background and my training in advertising and marketing um, and in the business world, I've developed a very critical eye for everything, everything that has to do with misinformation, manipulation, and deception. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that topic is of, well, I think it should be of great concern to everyone not, nowadays. <laughs> But uh, to me, it's it's a topic of it's definitely a passion point and and a a a point of ongoing investigation and um, and discussion because um, mm -hmm. we're we're at a point where yeah, there's corporate interests are. I think a lot of companies are out there to do good, and there's also a lot of a lot of um, you know misbehavior and just um, a lot of no good. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so it's it's kind of a tug of war for me uh, because I, I still have at least one foot in that world, right? And I work with organizations, so I need to, I need to be, you know, I, I need to be wise and skillful in how I navigate that and and preserve my own integrity. So, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other, the other aspect of it is what I said earlier. I, I got, I got at a point where I was looking for new clues as to what was going to be my my future, and I, I really, you know, just just out of maybe luck, curiosity, and, and restlessness, I stumbled across integral theory, and that became a, a clear path for me to, to follow and continue exploring. It really captured your interest. It really captured my interest, yeah. And, I, you know, I, I do remember one, one day I was, um, you know, between 2014 and 2015, I had several breakdowns. Uh, leaving the corporate world was one of them, but I had some. I also had a divorce, so I had some things go on in my personal life going on, and um, and that's just to mention a couple of things. But it was a really transformative period for me, where I was kind of thrown into this um, empty space, and I purposefully sought it out. So it was not entirely accidental. Uh, part of it was very, part of it was very intentional. I, I wanted to get to the point where I had a white canvas and that I could just start painting something new. And, um, and one of the questions that I just threw out there, and I remember clearly, I was just in a rented apartment in the first apartment that I rented after my divorce. And I was, it was pretty much an empty apartment and I was just I did have a bed, so I was just lying in bed looking at the ceiling. And the question that came up for me was, what is going to be my contribution to, to the world, to society from now on? And it was a wow moment, right? Because at that moment, I didn't have an answer. But it was throwing the question out there uh, into the empty space was, was a big moment. And slowly... I started getting some answers. <laughs> I'm still yeah. getting answers. So it's <laughs> I mean, you know, you you actively sought out that like reinvention of yourself, you know. I think sometimes when things like that happen in our life, 
some people get stagnant, you know, but you actively sought out the challenge and the change. Um, and I think that speaks a lot about just intention in general, you know, yeah. and being intentional in our daily lives. Yeah. Uh, it was also very painful. Uh, of course. I mean, any change is painful. I remember, I'll just, I'll just share this anecdote uh, uh, briefly. I, during that period, um, one of the conferences that I attended was the Aspen Ideas Festival. And um, it's in Colorado. And, um, and the, the very first talk that I, it's a three-day event. And the very first talk that I attended um, was on astrophysics. And you had this really fascinating young lady who's an, astro an astrophysicist herself. Her name is Jana Levin. And she was giving the talk and, you know, halfway into, or at the, at the beginning of her talk, and she had beautiful slides and, and her narrative was really um, engaging and entertaining. But at some point she said, the universe is expanding. And, and this, you know, this is, uh, this, uh, this was 2014. So it was not big news at the time that the new, new universe is expanding. But for me, it was. I, I had never heard of such a, such a thing. And, and what happened to me in that, in that moment was, where have I been? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> have I been living under a rock all this time? <laughs> <laughs> what, what is this? What, what else have I missed <laughs> yeah. about the world? And it was a huge... I mean, that obviously unleashed a whole process, right, that, that's been unfolding over, over the years. But that moment in particular for me was, was really breathtaking because I realized that, wow, there's so much more out there that I just wasn't aware of. And that, that seemed so fascinating. And mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole world out there, a whole universe, right? And yeah. It was a very... It was a very uh, it was a beautiful, it was a painful moment because I had to, I had to come to terms with the feeling that I had wasted a lot of my time. Right? Um, and, you know, I was already 40, you know, almost, almost in the mid 40s. So I was like, wow, you know, now, now where do I go from here? Right. So that, so then came the beautiful part of it, like, okay, this is mm -hmm. kind of new. Uh, it's a new beginning, really. Mm -hmm. uh, how can I make the most of it? Well, what an opportunity this is, right? right. I have to go through a period of mourning. <laughs> it's almost like, right. like letting a part of me die and rest in peace and then begin to, you know, allow a new part of me to, to, to emerge, right, or begin to emerge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was an amazing, an amazing moment. Yeah, that's a, it's a lot. Um, you know, I feel like in some ways throughout my life, every like five to ten years like just a major growth in my life, like growth, growth period happens. Um, I don't know, I just think it's, it's really interesting. And I, I like how you address it as an opportunity, you know, because really that's what those, those instances are. It's, a, it's an opportunity to say, hey, what I was doing wasn't working. Like, let's refocus here, you know? Um, and I think people often look at those sorts of situations with like dread versus like openness and, um, you know, just the perspective of it being a gift. Right. I think it makes all the difference. Um, 
Okay. Well, you've mentioned some about yourself. You have a partner named Betsy and a cat named Luna. Um, tell us more. What are your hobbies, interests, TV shows you're watching, music you're listening to, etc.? cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, well, a big part of my life uh, has always been um, staying very active. Um, uh, and I've practiced... I practiced a lot of different sports. Uh, I started at a very young age, uh, three or four. I started swimming and horseback riding and skiing and a number of things. And that eventually it evolved. I, I almost became a professional soccer player at some point. Uh, cool. Decided not to pursue that because I didn't like the politics of, of the sport. Um, but uh, up until recently, I was a competitive athlete. I did um, triathlon for many years, um, mountain climbing, race car driving. And so it's, it's been, wow. I've had a, a lot of a variety in that sense. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for that because for the most part, I was very healthy. And just, you know, just, I just enjoy doing all of that. But um Part of my part of that period of period of introspection and transformation was also I had to come I had to ask myself okay how do I how do I want to reprioritize my time and, and my energy mm -hmm. and because I started you know I, I noticed I was starting to pursue these you know all these different new goals and I was like okay I can't do everything uh, and I can't I can't just keep going. Uh, the way, you know, in terms of how I structure my week and my days. Uh, so I had, to, I had to let go of competitive sports. Um, so, but I've retained um, my love for trail running. So I do that uh, several times a week. Uh, every time I get, every opportunity I get, I go to spend some time in the wilderness. I do at least one a solo trip where I just go spend some time in a national park or in a mountain or somewhere. Um, but uh, it's usually more than one trip. Uh, sometimes Betsy goes with me. Uh, last Thanksgiving, we went to Moab, Utah. And we spent a week just hiking in the desert. Um, so the, being, being in nature is a big part of... Uh, me it's just a big part of me and um, and it's part of you know a big part of how I like to spend my time um, in terms of other activities um, I've become much more of a reader the last few years so so I, I try to read uh, I read a lot I read a lot of, I mean I, I must read about a hundred articles a week and I try to wow. read a couple of books a month that's awesome. Uh, and I, I have my own writing, so that you know, I have to balance reading with writing. <laughs> yeah, I I've always been very uh, attracted to to the TV screen since I was a little a, a little boy. Um, nowadays, I don't really watch anything. I don't watch TV per se. I don't watch cable news. I don't watch any, I don't watch any of that. But I do watch a lot of movies and uh, TV series or, or Netflix series, if you will. Um, I like to do that. And I, I meditate um, almost on a daily basis. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I cook. It's not really a hobby, but uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the cook in the house. So <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Some of it is enjoyable, some of it is, is, is a chore, but that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, you know, I don't have, um, well, we don't have kids yet, so so there's there's some, you know, free time. Um, I try to... I try Keyword to, being yet. Yeah, not yet. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Ongoing 
It's an ongoing <laughs> conversation. Or that. Yes, as it should be. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I cut you off there. I just had to put that in there for Betsy. <laughs> Um, I wonder how, how she will react when she hears this. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, what? <laughs> uh, hi, Betsy. <laughs> um, okay, well, going back to coaching for a second, um, are there any specialties you have as a coach? Or what would you say your specialties are? Hmm. Yeah. Um, the truth is that I see myself more as a generalist than a specialist. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just part of my makeup. Uh, Which I think kind of goes hand in hand with like integral theory in some ways. Right, right. You know, yeah. because, because the integral approach is by definition all encompassing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, that, that's the way I, I I, I like to roll, <laughs> I guess. So, but I hear that. I, even though I don't, I don't uh, really um, don't speak much of of my work as a specialty. Um, I would say I, I I think more in terms of offering my clients resources, uh, frameworks, practices, mm -hmm. and tools that might be useful. So um, what I do is I try to build as, as big of a toolkit as I can, and then depending, depending on each case, you know, I, I'll pull the tools that I think are, can be most, most useful. Um, uh, part of those tools are actually, you know, oftentimes I bring, in order to creatively stimulate the conversation, I can bring a movie clip, or I can, I can bring a song or a poem, uh, so, so my work is, 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 tends to be pretty creative in that sense. Um, the common thread throughout my entire career, uh, because what I'm doing today is in a way a continuation of what I used to do before. Mm -hmm. The common thread that I see is to understand human motivations and cultural narratives that drive mm -hmm that drive individuals, organizations, and societies. So, because, you know, the same, some of the same, some of the same disciplines that you have to engage with in order to understand what drives um, a, a person to, to want to buy a particular product or service or work for a particular company, um, or travel to a particular destination, or even live in a particular city. You know, some of some of these basic human drives are are the same. You know, for you know how how you know who you choose to date, or where you choose to 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 go to school, or um, what what kind of home you want to live in oh so and and then of course when you when you open the the when you broaden the lens to understanding how entire societies or cultures or countries or you know nations uh, operate you can begin applying some of the same principles right? I, mean, I mentioned i mentioned the enneagram earlier the enneagram is a, is a tool that uh, one of the things i like about it is that it's, it's very versatile because you can apply it to to understanding individuals, um, you can also apply it to, uh, to understand. You can apply uh, apply it to understand organizations, groups, um, and you can apply it to understanding an entire culture. Right? Um, so, so I these are different kind of different levels. Um, of, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So again, yeah, it's it's like uh, it's hard for me to to it's it's like when people ask me where are you from and then they like, oh <laughs> how do I how do I answer that it's 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 hard um, yeah and and it's I mean it's not hard it's just hard to for me to just pick one country I, it, right yeah <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't work 
I mean, it, especially it, it, when you feel I, like I don't, has... I don't feel I'm being authentic in my in my response. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm I'm always looking for. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of looking at my work, not as a specialty, but as a, maybe a discipline, I'm always looking at an array of factors that might be influencing or coloring or clouding uh, mm -hmm. maybe my client's perspective, attitude, and behavior. I look at personality, I look at identity, spirituality, technology, uh, among many other things. So... So in a way, in a way, my specialty is to help clients connect the dots. Mm -hmm. Right. And that kind of leads me into my next question, where um, I read that your mission, simply put, is to help people, and I quote, to help people see new possibilities, end quote. Can you elaborate on that as it applies to your approach to coaching? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful question. I really appreciate that. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very, that's my personal mission, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it is very personal. And um, the guiding metaphor that I use is the wind. So in fact, um, I picked the name Shiroko for my practice um, because that is the name of a famous wind that blows across the Mediterranean from Northern Africa into Southern Europe. And as you know, the wind is this invisible force, but, but it can be very powerful in leaving an imprint or shaping entire landscapes or propelling sailboats and so on and so forth. Um, and it can also be very destructive, right? So that's, that's where the shadow, <laughs> the shadow right. part of it come, comes into play as well. So, so for me, it's always about helping people see something for themselves. Mm -hmm. so that, that's really, I think that's what the mission speaks to. And I, because I, when I picked the name for my practice, I could have just picked, you know, christianfeely.com. Right. I decided to pick shiroko.com uh, because I I really had mixed feelings about this being about me right? and I was like no this is this is, it can't be about me yes I may be in certain moments and I need to I need to get up on the stage and, and, and do, do my thing but at, and at the end at the end of the day it's not it can't be about me right? so, so I don't mind I don't mind my clients forgetting about me or forgetting the, methodo the methodology, I think it is more important that they walk away with something that helps shape their life for the better in some way, in some way. Um, and yeah, and, and, and my approach is, is developmental, right? So we talked a little bit about that already. So, so my approach is, is integral and ultimately is developmental. So it's, it's, it's about helping clients fully understand their present and also work towards the future. Mm -hmm. so, and that's, you know, that's when oftentimes new possibilities emerge right? because, and that's, you know, more often than not, it's, it's why they come to a coach is because they, they're not very clear on, on what those new possibilities might be. And so, so that's Got it. Okay. Now you have a book titled Hidden Delta, The Crucial Role of Symbolic Thought to Advancing Humanity. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? Yeah, gladly. Um, for now, it's only available as an ebook, uh, and it can be obtained at bookboom.com. Uh, which is an online publisher based in the UK. The, the print version um, is only available upon request for now. And uh, I know you already had a copy, so. <laughs> uh, which I, I will read at some point when my ADHD planting. lets me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been planting it here and there, uh, but I hope to make it publicly available 
sometime in the spring. And so Hidden Delta is, it's a fairly short read, but it's also pretty dense because I explore different facets of the human condition from how we think, how we discover, how we learn, how we create, to how we work, to how we lead and how we grow, right? Uh, both individually and collectively. I explore concepts such as constructive disagreement, lifelong learning, um, interdisciplinary thinking. So one of the chapters is titled Homo Universalis, right, which um, speaks to the idea of being a polymath, um, a Renaissance person, um, you know, one of the most famous characters is Leonardo da Vinci. It's mm -hmm. kind of that idea uh, of us being in a moment, you know, in, in history where the, the best thing that one can do is, is kind of prepare oneself to having to reinvent oneself at least once, if not multiple times throughout our lifetimes, because entire, entire job industries are, are going away right, in the next mm -hmm. five to 10 years. And that's a big deal, right? Um, and yeah, just things are shaping up in a very different way in, in the up this century than, than they did in previous centuries and at a, at a much different rate. So that's one, one aspect uh, of the book. But I also, in general, I discuss human qualities such as curiosity, courage, and resolve, as well as our pursuit of success, achievement, happiness, meaning. Um, so I, I like to think of it as a bit of a, a bit of philosophy for working people, regardless mm -hmm. of what field you're, you're in or whether you work on your, on your own or with a company, right? Uh, just reflect about how I actually start the book by mentioning Michael Marsh, who had this uh, amazing TED talk on how to design your life, because if you don't design your life, someone else will design it for you. So that's mm -hmm. kind of that, that you know, general idea. Um, so how, how can you be a little more intentional about designing your own life, right? Um, and, um, and, and, and eventually you need to redesign it as well, right? So you've designed it, but then you need to, you know, you'll have, you will probably have new iterations of that. So, but more importantly, I believe the book is an invitation for readers to reflect on some of the wonders and challenges of being human. Well, one, one core aspect of it being our unique capacity for storytelling, symbolism, and you know, mythological thinking, not to mention magical thinking, which is the less healthy version of that, of that. Right. I also cover a bit of evolutionary history, starting with the cognitive revolution that took about 70,000 70, years ago. Uh, up until the hypothetical moment in the future when we come in contact with alien life. So, so if you look at how the book, it's kind of a, and again, it's a, it's a, brief, it's a brief journey because it goes, it's only about 100 pages, uh, but it goes from, yeah, what happened 70,000 years ago <laughs> and what might happen in, in the near future in terms of how, how, we, how we understand how we perceive our, our life on this planet, right? And in, and, in, and, in, and in the universe, because now, I mean, the, some of the new discoveries that are about to happen in the next decade or two uh, are really gonna be amazing. Um, and we don't know what they, they will be, but, but the, again, the tools that we have at our disposal right now um, are just unbelievable. And, 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 and the speed at which we're discovering, you know, exoplanets and all of that. So I think there's going to be there, there's um, there's a lot of reason nowadays to be pessimistic uh, about basically everything. There's some reason to be optimistic. Um, 
And on the other hand, there's a lot of reason to be just curious and just, you know, just as open-minded as we can about what, what, might, what we might learn and discover. Right? So, so it's, it's, I think it's an interesting time to be alive. It's, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's a worrisome time to be alive, but I think it's also a very exciting time to be alive. Yeah, a lot is changing, for sure. Um, so it sounds like it's what you're just kind of some of what you're what I heard you were talking about is talking about like the reinvention of the self through um, being intentional through looking at our perceptions and interpretations of things, which ultimately plays into how we create meaning. Um, which meaning is interesting to me. I, I really am into like existentialism and logotherapy. And Viktor Frankl, right. who the, the father of logotherapy, he says that there's three ways to discover meaning. And that's through creativity, experience, and change of attitude, which, right. which would happen through the reinvention of self. I feel like it would be a, a natural process of that. Um, so I, I just wanted to to point that out and, and just say that I, I like I like where you're going with all that, and then I'm really excited to read the book. Um, and uh, learn more about what you have to say. That way I can have a more in-depth conversation with you about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, cool. Well, thank you for sharing that about the book. Sounds awesome. Can't wait to read it. Um, so thinking about life coaching, who will life coaching benefit? And how do you think it benefits people? Like who would benefit from going to see a life coach? And what sorts of things might they get out of it? Right. Yeah, this is, this is kind of like, you know, when you go to a restaurant and and um, either the waiter or the the, the met comes and, and and you ask them, you know, what's what's good today? <laughs> <laughs> they say, oh, everything here, everything, everything is good. Everything that comes out of our kitchen is good. Uh, so it's kind of a it's kind of a cliche to say that <laughs> can benefit anyone, right? Yeah. Um, which I mean, yeah, to, to a certain degree, it is true. Um, that said, however, um, in my experience, uh, so far at least, it seems to be most useful to those who are experiencing some level of discomfort with their status quo. Right? So, so if, if there's no discomfort at all, I mean... Then there's no motivation to change. It's hard to... Yeah, the motivation is kind of lacking, right? The, mm -hmm. the, there's nothing really bugging you, right? So, so, so it's, it, yeah, and again, in my experience, it's hard enough. Like one of the words that we, that we use a lot in, in the coaching circles is enrolling our clients, right? Mm -hmm. the, enroll in, the enrollment part doesn't just happen at the very beginning. Um, like even if they come, like if they are actively seeking out a coach, there is a process of enrolling them. Um, um, and and that, that might entail many different things. Sometimes it's, it's just helping them get comfortable with the idea of sitting down and opening up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that can be a big part of the enrollment. But enrollment is also about keeping them engaged. Right? And it's hard man, because oftentimes... Um, we all have busy lives, right? And, I, and I've been there myself, you know? you know. It's like, oh, shit, tomorrow I have a coaching appointment. I didn't do my assignment, or I didn't do my week. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to be very, very, uh, like, again, I really like the word intentional because you have to be very in, in, intentional and very disciplined about including this or adding this to your, mm -hmm. your schedule, right? Because it's, it's not just about showing up for a session, you know, every two or three weeks. 
It's about the work you do in between sessions. That's really mm-hmm. important. So, so when a when a client comes comes to coaching, they might know they might know exactly what's bothering them, or they may have just a vague idea. Right. So that's a good start. Right. So we have something to to be, to begin working with. Now the other the other key factor, as I mentioned, is being willing to put the effort. Right? Because coaching is not very effective if, um, if 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 the coachee doesn't put in the work. Um, right. And coaching, one way of understanding coaching is that it's it's most of all a practice. So 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 as a for me as a coach, it's a practice because I need to constantly practice not only being a coach, but I need to practice being a human being and developing myself, right? So that I can do a better and better job uh, with my clients. But for the coachee, it also has to be a practice. Mm-hmm. And so if, if we wish to make any kind of pivot in, in our lives, we need to practice. There's just no other way around it. If, if we continue doing exactly the same thing, we spoke about observable outcomes earlier, right? So if, if, if you want different observable outcomes um, or if you, if you want to have to experience a shift in, in attitude and perspective or, or, or behavior, you need to practice a different attitude, different behavior. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> just, you just call for it and it will happen. Um, right. So it's, it's, of, it's, of li- it's of little use if a client has... For example, right? It's, if a client has a desire to be more assertive, right? Let's say, if they are not willing to adopt practices that help them be more assertive, they will not become more assertive, because it's a it's a nice it's 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 wishful thinking, right? That oh, I will just become more assertive by showing up to the sessions, and then I'm done. It's not gonna. It's not. It's not gonna happen, right? At all. I mean, they might yeah. have something else out of the sessions, but it's not. When you're li- really looking at a change in behavior or a change in outcomes, you need to practice that different outcome. It may not. The result or the outcome may not happen in in a couple of weeks or you know six weeks, right? Uh, but eventually, it happens if you're if you're you know consciously practicing. Yeah, I think people forget that about therapy too, that it's not just about showing up for session. Like, you've got to do the work in between sessions or nothing is going to change. What would you say are some common misconceptions about life coaching or life coaches in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, to be honest, I don't have enough data on this. But one thing that I think to a certain degree can hurt or does hurt the profession is that practically anyone, there, are, there aren't enough, or, I mean, essentially there are no guardrails. Right. You know, like a therapist cannot just declare overnight, oh, I want to be a therapist and that's it. Right. Uh, a coach could do that. Right. They, they mm-hmm. could just say, and, I, and you know, sometimes I've seen people in their mid twenties who say, "Oh, I want to be a coach." Um, okay, um, do you know what it takes to be a coach? Right. And then, mm-hmm. then there's that. Then they start realizing, "Oh, you know, this is these are all the things that actually you know, need to happen." And yeah, there's no regulations. There's, there's, I mean, yes, we have the ICF, and and I think the, this 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 organ does a, a, a very decent job in, in um, creating some, you know, some standards, um, but a, a coach is not obligated to be a, even a member of, of ICF, let alone get a certification from ICF. But, and I'm not even saying, you know, I, I'm not, because these things can be expensive. Like my, my coaching training took, took a whole year, right? Uh, and, and, 
it was a lot of a huge time commitment and a huge financial commitment. So I totally understand that no one, not not everyone is in, in a position to, you know, just send a check to the school and, and, and set aside that, that, amount, that amount of time. And mm-hmm. energy. You know, people have families. Some, and some, some of my colleagues in coaching school, they were actually, they had full-time jobs, right? At the time I was, I was in between, right? So I was in limbo. So I, I, it was easier. It was easier for me. I mean, yes, I was starting my own practice simultaneously, but it's a very different thing than having a full-time job and family commitments and then, you know, doing, doing some kind of formal training. Um, and, and yet I, I do think it's, it's, it's important um, to, some, to have some kind of formal training. Uh, whatever, whatever is possible for the person, I think some kind of formal training is, is, is important. Or life or relevant life experience even. You know? Yeah, experience. I think that is, um, you know, when I mentioned the example of a, a, a 25-year-old, um, I'm not, I think there are 25-year-olds that are incredibly wise. Um, and and they, you know, some of them have definitely had very rich um, lives already by, by that time. However, it's it's not the same, right? When when you've already accumulated um, a number of years um, dealing with disappointment, dealing with conflict, and dealing with um, setbacks, and dealing with also dealing with success, and dealing with dealing with people, and right? just dealing with people. Um, um, so, so I do think it makes a, it, both the experience and the formal training, some kind of formal tra- training, does make a difference. Um, it also depends what kind of coach you want to be, right? Uh, if you want to be, you can be a, finan- a financial wizard, and then you know one day you decide to be a financial coach. Okay, that's totally fine. If you've been, I don't know, I'm just make, gonna make this up, right? If you've been playing video games since a very early age and by the time you're 22, you're like this incredible genius of video games and you wanna coach other people to play video games or invest in video games or do something with video games. Hey, that's great. That's, I think that's awesome. I know nothing about video games, right? I would definitely benefit from a young, experienced gamer, <laughs> if I wanted to. <laughs> I'm sure there would be I lots of applications. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when it comes to, you know, in my case, integral coaching, that's a whole different ballgame. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, li- life coach is a term that I tend to shy away from. Mm-hmm. Uh, although some of my work definitely falls falls within that realm, you know, maybe ten percent, fifteen percent could be characterized as such. Um, I I don't love the term because I don't know. Maybe I'm a little prejudiced against the term, to be honest, uh, because it it doesn't sound very rigorous. Um, so I I do think that coaching requires some basic level of rigor and right? mm-hmm. you need to be able to structure the sessions you need to be able to structure a develop a development plan for your client you need to have some knowledge of how human beings are wired right um, so those are some of the considerations you know according to the according to some studies conducted by by the icf there are many HR practitioners in companies who claim to coach people right, in, their, in their organizations. And I get very suspicious every time I hear that right? because it's like, well, what, what do you mean by coaching? <laughs> right. Do you mean giving them advice? Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's one of the often, you know, the common misconceptions about coaching is, oh, what kind of advice are you gonna give me? Right? Um, 
I've, I've had, I've had, you know, I've met clients that before we started working together, they were like, well, such and such, such and such, and such person recommended that I work with you or my boss wants me to work with you, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid you're going to start giving me advice on how to lead my life. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. It's not what I do at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. And as therapists, of course, they, they teach us not to give advice too. you know, um, I think that people are just sensitive to advice giving, especially like unsolicited, you know, <laughs> which we all have that one person in our family who loves to give advice. Right. <laughs> um, anyway, getting back to one of the questions, um, what kind of experience do you have working with particularly vulnerable clients, such as those who are transgender, undocumented, or BIPOC, to name a few examples? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the first thing I, I, I will say to that is I welcome anyone as a client, um, as, as long as they are adults and have the faculties to work on developing themselves as human beings. So, um, yeah, there's, in that regard, there's absolutely no boundary on my end. Uh, I am fascinated with how diverse, how diverse humanity is. Uh, and I always learn something from having exposure to people who have different backgrounds and hold different views. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, work with all of that uh, more than happy. My, my own life you know, has been so diverse that you know, I, uh, it's, to me that this is a, this is a second nature to me. Uh, mm-hmm. My job as a coach is always to acknowledge where my client is coming from and, and, and work with that. Right? Where, where are they at? Where are they hoping to accomplish? And, and co-create the whole process with them. Because it is a it is co-creation. Every session is is kind of a dance. Right? Mm-hmm. So as far as demographics and identities go, um, I, I I tend to see these as just only a part of the story. So, so they they may have a direct impact on on the coaching process or the coaching program. And sometimes they don't. You know, the, the, key thing, the key thing for me is to not make assumptions about anyone simply because they may fit within certain social categories. Um, so and that, that's kind of the way I, I prefer to operate. Um, so to give you a concrete example, um, if someone who identifies as transgender or gay is seeking coaching because they want to be a better leader, let's say, or because they want to be able to communicate better or because they want to make a career change. I don't see a reason why I couldn't, why we couldn't work together. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, um, and here's where honesty and discernment comes in, right? If that individual, specifically requires a coach who knows firsthand what it feels like to be trans or gay, well, that is their wish and that is their right. And I totally respect that, right? So when I I, I mentioned that coaching program that I had um, about seven years ago, and this is even before I was thinking of becoming a coach myself. uh, At the time I saw my athletic pursuits as being a big part of my identity, right? And in my head, I needed to work with a coach uh, who understood that part of my identity, who was, who was uh, an athlete. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so that, that's, that's how I viewed things at that, at that moment in time. The interesting thing that happened was right after the first session, or I think even after the, 
after the intake. <laughs> that thing that I thought was so important for the coaching relationship um, quickly fell uh, to, to the background. So, so it was an interesting, and I probably didn't realize it until you know, maybe the second or third session, but I was like, well, this is, it, it almost became irrelevant. Because the topic, the general topic that we were working with had to do with something completely different, right? or it was pretty independent from, from my identity as an athlete. Right? So I mean, that's, a, that's a personal example. Right? But again, I think, I think it's, it's totally valid. You know, if, if the coachee or potential coachee has a preference, and absolutely, by all means, you know, you, you, the, the, the coaching relationship only works if there is some basic chemistry. So if, if that's not there, and actually, you know, every time there's always, there's always a chemistry check before beginning the coaching relationship because you can't, you can't just pair up two people to work together for several months, right? Often, you know, in some cases it's up to a year or maybe more. If, if there's no, if there's not a bit like initial, a basic connection, and that connection can be based on, on, on identity, can be on based on language, it can be based on age, uh, you know, it, and I think it's totally valid. Now, I think the the interesting word there in your question is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I think that's a broader subject for me. Vulnerability. The way I see it as an emotional state, which which can be driven by numerous factors. So, I, I mean, one name that comes to mind is Brené Brown. She's you know, true mm -hmm. her. She's done a lot of work on vulnerability. So we all have situations in life or phases in life, and yes, you know, sometimes there are external factors that makes us feel vulnerable. Right. Um, and you know, this is where our common humanity comes in. We all experience that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I need to refrain from assuming that some people are by definition more vulnerable than others because of their skin color or sexual orientation or immigration status. Um, I, I cannot walk into a coaching relationship with that kind of assumption. And um, I happen to have worked quite a bit with Latin American immigrants in the US who live in a constant state of uncertainty about their legal status. Mm -hmm. Yet those same individuals are some of the most vibrant, hardworking, optimistic, and resilient people that I've ever come across. Right? If I were to walk in, uh, you know, into the room and tell them, oh, you are a victim of your circumstances, they would look at me like I'm, a, <laughs> like I'm, like I'm crazy. Because they don't see it that way, right? No, it does. It's, it's the same thing. It does. That may be a different experience for other people, and and maybe that becomes the subject of of conversation. But again, it's. I think it depends a lot on the individual. It depends on their circumstances. You know, not too far, not too long ago, I coached a black woman who had spent several years in the military in the US military, and was now pursuing her graduate degree and looking to become an entrepreneur. And she literally saw herself as a badass. Again, she actually, mm -hmm. you know, those are her words, not mine. She was extremely creative um, and spiritual and extroverted. And it was just a great delight to work with her. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think I, yeah, yeah, I see where you're coming from. But I, I do think that there's like just moving around in society that some people are more vulnerable than others. Like, you know, for example, a black man um, is much more likely to have negative interactions with the police than a white man, right? Um, and that I think just that puts context into 
like somebody's like maybe somebody's fears for example um but I, I see what you're saying by really we're only as vulnerable as we make ourselves or think we are um you know and not everybody views themselves as vulnerable but i think it is important to note that certain people are more vulnerable to um you know certain social treatment than others i think that that that's what i wanted to say about that um but yeah i totally see yeah, your that, point there. Fair, fair enough i mean there are uh, you know i think everything everything that has happened this past year or maybe few years i think has invited us to invited us all to reflect on some of the yeah some of the aspects of our modern society that that still merit adjustments uh, for sure um but there's and just even recognizing our privileges yeah uh and 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 yeah i i would say we need to be we need to be a little more i like to think of our common humanity more than i think i think there's we have there's greater potential for us to cohere as as a civilization when when we start looking at human beings as human beings and not instead of categories because yes there is suffering in the world there's no doubt about that there are 80 million people living in refugee camps right from all over the world there are you know, there was a steel worker in the Midwest who lost his job to automation, who struggles with addiction and has three mouths to feed and he's living in a, in a trailer park and he's white, right? There's suffering there. We have to, so, mm -hmm. so there's, there's suffering in the world, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I think, there, there are, uh, yeah, I, I think that's as much as I would want to explore that subject for today because it, it can go very, very deep. And get yeah, no, for sure. Um, earlier you were talking about um, like potential structure in your sessions. Um, what, what could a new client expect from like an initial session with you? Um, is there a structure to your sessions? Do you tend to be more directive or non-directive? Or, you know, does it depend for you? What, where, where do you fall on that? Um, well, the first formal session tends to be an intake. Mm -hmm. So the, the structure of that first session is usually um, an open explora exploration of the client's overall content, you know, some of the, and, and again, it, it, because it's, the intake itself is fairly integral, um, I try to understand the, the context with as much of a broad lens as I can. Uh, what, are, what are some of the most important people in your life right now? What are some of the most mm -hmm. important relationships? What are some of uh, you know, what do you do? Like, how do you spend your time? What, what brings you to coaching? Well, let's talk a little more about that. Um, what, how do you see yourself? How do other people see you? So it's, it's really, it's an open exploration of where, where, the, where the client, you know, finds them, themselves, right? Right. And, okay. and where, where do, you know, what they expect to get out of what do they expect to get out of this? What they what would they like to get out of this? So that that's kind of the first session, and it's usually ninety minutes long. It can it can run a bit longer. I've had clients with whom I had to do two intake sessions because 
there, there was just a lot there that they wanted yeah. to put yeah. <laughs> the table. So that's rare though. You know, it's usually one session is one session is usually enough to get like a good picture of okay, this is this is what we can work with. Um, and subsequent questions, sub, sorry, subsequent sessions tend to be um, about an hour long, and there's usually a quick check in. Well, how are you? <laughs> how? How, how, how have this past couple of weeks been for you? Anything new that came up for you, either in your life or as a result of the previous session, um, right? Uh, and then, and then, then we look at, okay, if there was any practice that had been assigned, you know, how, how did it go with the practice? Any, any new insight, any, 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 any struggle, any, any breakdown, any, 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 obstacles uh, sometimes they haven't engaged with the practice at all so okay why not right? mm -hmm. um, and and yeah and usually there's something something that emerges out of that check-in right that that then provides enough fuel for for that conversation and and so it goes right it's it's almost you almost i always pick up where we left off yeah some continuity and we keep building, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's usually some kind of progression. And in terms of duration of programs, it really varies. Uh, like right now, I'm involved with Coach UT, which is a program at the University of Texas for students at the university. And it's a group of coaches that have been hired by, by the university, by the Leadership and Ethics uh, in Institute at the university. And the program is, is st structured uh, in such a way that each student gets five sessions total. Right? So there's a little more rigidity there. But there, there was some trial and error at the beginning to see what the right number of sessions could be. Because this is something that the univers university is offering students who work at the university as a perk. So it can't, you know, it, it's not realistic to have <laughs> the each individual do, you know, however, how, however many sessions they want <laughs> and all that. So, but then with other clients, uh, it can be more sessions. Um, I like to leave it open because if to the extent that it's possible, uh, you know, let's start with maybe six sessions see where we are at the end of the sixth session and then and then we and then we plan for the next phase if necessary if you want to all of that um, i like that yeah so i i kind of have to be very flexible because i i i i tend to engage with very different populations and audiences so i need to i need to kind of yeah uh, dance according to the music a little bit in that regard. In terms of non-directive or directive, it's um, it's a little bit of both because I need to keep clients accountable because this is their program, it's not mine. Uh, it's Correct. their development, right? So if, if they're not doing the practices or if they not if they are not showing up on time or if they if, if they're not showing up at all for the session. Or you know, where I assigned a reading or something, and they just they're not engaging with it. I need to re-enroll them, right? <clears throat> and there is um, sometimes in session the conversations, you know, they can start deviating too much from the topic at hand, or sometimes they get stuck in a story, uh, too much in the story. Uh, and then we start losing the substance. So I need to bring them back to the substance. Um, so, so in that sense, it, it, there, there, there is some direction. Um, but at the same time, there needs to be enough freedom for them to, to get in touch with their whatever is coming up for them mm -hmm. in the moment. Right? Uh, I remember 
one time, you know, when there was this mass shooting at a club in Florida, uh, I think it was a gay club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. of people. Pulse, I think was the name oh, of the club. Exactly. So that was back in 2016, I think. And I had a, I had a coachee at the time who was, we were maybe halfway through the program when this happened. And she was very active in the field of social justice. And she was deeply, deeply impacted by that event. And she came into the session, she showed up on time, but she was absolutely destroyed. And she just couldn't stop crying. Because she, she was just so touched by that event. And I had to, what came up for me in that moment was, I have to allow her the space right, right now mm -hmm. to, to mourn. And yes, we did, we had a conversation, right? So we were able to explore some of the, you know, why was this affecting her so much, right? On what level? Um, and what you wanted to do with that. So there was some coaching involved, but it was also just holding the space for her, just to manifest the sadness, right? This deep sadness that she was experiencing. So that was important. And then for the following session, she was, it was like nothing had happened. She showed up fresh, strong, ready to roll, right? So, but that day in particular was very non-directive on my part. <laughs> it was like, mm -hmm. yeah, just, just being there for her, right? Just being mm -hmm. like a, um, offering her a shoulder to cry on. <laughs> yeah. How would you say your clients would describe or experience you? It's a hard uh, question, I know. I think that's that's the next. That's, the, that's where I invoke the next question card. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question is, what have you personally learned about yourself and or the world through your practice? Oh, so much. Um, I would say one of the biggest thing is developing a greater capacity to be with opposites or being with paradox or being with ambiguity, you know, holding, holding conflicting ideas at the same time. Right? Um, so I think that's, that's a big one. That's a big one for me that has emerged and developed over like recently, like the past two or three years, really. I, I did not have that capacity at all for me. Before I began my development as a coach and before I uh, did, you know, before I started doing everything that I, that I did the past, the past few years, I was, I was much more rigid in my, in my views and my judgment, um, particularly my moral judgment, um, you know, much more strict about rules and structure and, mm -hmm. um, and, but more than anything, it was like much, much more of a, an either or mentality. And it's like, if, if, if A is right, B has to be wrong. There's no way that there's a partial truth in both, right? And right. now it's, now it's really much, 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 I mean, radically, radically different. In fact, the, the next book that I've, I've already started working on um, is largely based on, on this, right? It's kind of what I've learned, right, the last few years about being able to, to, to do that. And I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a really important, I think it's a really important capacity that we develop collectively. Right? 
because with the kinds of um, polarizations that we see today, growing polarizations that we see in the, in the extremes that we are seeing today, um, and we need to, we really need to get to a point where we're a little more capable of um, having, having our views, having our, having our moral center and acknowledging that, you know, no one is entirely good and no one is entirely bad or no, no one is entirely correct and, and no one is entirely incorrect. Right. It's, it's, it's just um, Ken Wilbur, actually, who I mentioned earlier, he has a saying, or it's one of his core principles that everybody's right. <laughs> everybody's right, or or no one is entirely wrong. That's another way of of looking. No at one it. is entirely wrong. No one is entirely wrong. That doesn't mean that everyone is equally right. <laughs> <laughs> Like that. <laughs> always, you know, like you can take some of the most polarizing or obnoxious characters um, or, you know, the people that you consider the most obnoxious and polarizing characters. And if you're really honest and, and really, really compassionate or a little bit compassionate, um, you're going to find some truth. You, you, you're going to find something about them that resonates with you mm -hmm. and, and that actually you may share, right? you know, coming, coming back to the shadows, right? Mm -hmm. like you can look at someone like, you know, Donald Trump and, and feel an in instant or a natural aversion to, to the individual and want to distance yourself as much as possible from him. Right? Um, but if you really, if you really want to do a little bit of honest introspection, you're going to find something, something that connects you to him. There's something there. There's always something there. Even in the most extreme, extreme, because we, I think that's another trend that I that I'm seeing in in, in our culture today, particularly in the U.S. and and in the Anglosphere in general. It's this desire to like this desire to come across as pure um, of of being right about everything or being on the right side of history it's a very strong impulse i mean i get it i can i can understand where it comes from but it's leading us in a it's leading us down a very dangerous path. And it's this absolute, absolute lack of capacity to look, to look at yourself in the mirror. I just stop. Like my invitation to people is this, like just stop for a moment and look, your, look at yourself in the mirror and see if you can find something there that upsets you at least a little bit about yourself. Right? And, and maybe that helps you understand why you're rejecting other people so passionately. <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe, there's yeah. hint, maybe there's just a hint there that you can work with. But, it, but yeah, it's, it's this desire, it's, 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 it's you, it's not me, right? It's like this. It's a very right. strong narrative, right? We, we spoke about narratives a little bit. We didn't talk a lot about that, but that's a very powerful narrative. Mm -hmm. It's not you, it's not me. So at the end of a long day, what do you do to take care of yourself? Well, actually, some of it I do at, at the beginning of at the beginning of my day. And so I think, well, I have first of all, I have a breakfast routine. So Okay. My breakfast is uh, holy ground. <laughs> so I usually have breakfast on my own. So Betsy gets up a, a little bit later. I usually have breakfast on my own. Um, and um, yeah, sometimes I just 
reflect on you know, the state of affairs, uh, or mm. the state of affairs in my life, or the state of affairs, uh, generally speaking. Uh, sometimes I take, I read something or I, I watch, I catch up with something on YouTube on human development, or I, I love watching interviews. Uh, so I have my go-to uh, interviewers and I see what they're up to and what they're talking about. And cool. I'm, I'm just so curious about so many topics. So I, I, I like to use that time to, to try and find something interesting to learn about. So I usually go out for a run after breakfast. So, so that's my kind of morning routine. Um, and then in terms of taking care of myself in general, I would say there's, well, I try to eat a healthy diet. Um, and that's, it wasn't always the case. Uh, it's something that I started developing maybe in the last decade, more strongly so in the last five or six years, just being more conscious of what I put into my body. Um, and and it's it's made a, it's made a huge difference and and I'm more and more conscious about that because I feel like there's so much stuff that I'm interested in and that I want to do uh, you know I want to coach I want to write I want to I'll do all these things I want to travel and I, the first thing is I have to be healthy you know, I have to have good energy to be, to be able to do all of that the other aspect is the information diet. I think that's a big part, right? Um, I think infor our information diet is killing us, just like fast food is killing us, right? So social media has become, you know, not, not all of it, but a big part of it has become incredibly toxic. So, so toxic. Uh, so if, if you spend too many hours on social media, they are, you know, it's really like you're drinking poison straight out of the bottle. It's not good. Um, so you need to <laughs> What I do is I, I use social media very, very uh, sporadically um, and very, yeah, I'm very, very careful with that because it's just, it's just, um, yeah, it's more, actually, I use it less and less. Right? So I try to, I'm more towards long form reading. I try to, and, and re, it requires discipline. It's just mm -hmm. not these days. You know, it's like so much, this fear of missing out. I think we all suffer from it a little bit. Fama. <laughs> 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 uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, so yeah. So in, I don't know, other things, I mean, no, I don't drink. Uh, I stopped all alcohol consumption about a year ago. I was drinking very little already, but then I said, I don't, doesn't, doesn't really do much for me. So stopped all alcohol, um, never smoked, never did drugs. So I plan to keep it that way. And as I mentioned earlier, for me, time in nature is everything. Uh, right. Even if it's a little bit, uh, we're lucky enough to live across the street from Walnut Creek, so um, so it's 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 amazing because I, I can just cross the street and be in the woods. You know, it's a small park, but it's it's got trails and it's got trees and birds and deer. <laughs> it's unbelievable in yeah. you know in Austin. Uh, so I, I try to take advantage of that and yeah, just it's it's also a habit. You know, that it needs to cultivate. It's easy to. It's easy to let go and, and become lazy about that, but I, I think it's it's absolutely vital. Um, for in my case, I know it is absolutely critical for my health and well-being, and and, yeah. and the way I can be present, you know, for for my clients and for my work, if I if I have that those basic uh, routines, you know, makes sense. Makes sense. How would you define happiness? Oof, that's a great topic. 
um, well, there's so many ways to look at it. I, I'd say we can look at it first and foremost as a primary emotion, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Pixar movie Inside Out does, I think, does a wonderful job in outlining the five core emotions. Right? Mm -hmm. Happiness, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust. Um, so, I don't know. When, when things are going our way, or there's an absence of pain and suffering, we feel happy, right? So that's, that's, it's a feeling. Um, but uh, as the movie shows, as the movie Inside Out shows, and here's a spoiler alert for those who have not watched it, <laughs> 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 is that sadness is the one who saves the day, right? Have you seen it? Yeah, I love that movie. It's so good. Yeah, I've watched it like a few times already. Um, but of course, I mean, what's tricky about, about this way of understanding happiness is that there's always that thing we experience or that event we experience and then how we remember what we experienced, right? Mm -hmm. so, so this is what the, the, the Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, uh, calls the experiencing self and the remembering self. And these, these, are, it's, these are two fascinating forces that we have with, you know, in, in our psyche. And um, they are rarely on the same page with regards to how happy an event actually made us feel. Right? So we, we may have felt amazingly happy in, in the moment, but then we remember, we may remember it as such, or, me, or we may not. And often, more often than not, we don't remember it exactly as it was, right? Right. Um, and and the, the pessimistic in us tends to, tends to sabotage uh, the way we remember it. Another way of looking at happiness is as a social metric mm -hmm. for well-being. Um, the country of Bhutan, for example, has the gross national happiness, gross national happiness index. And it is something they take very seriously. They've been using it for, I don't know, like 30 years or more. So interesting. Globally, uh, globally, we measure the happiness of countries. Mm -hmm. And even the UN has become a little more diligent about that the last five, six years. Uh, and, and this measure of happiness is done based on a number of factors that go way beyond how people feel in the moment. Right? Um, it has to do with environmental conservation, it has to do with income per capita, it includes, you know, just good governance. So it's, it's a number of factors. There, there are different studies, but there's usually, I think Bhutan has maybe 10 different factors that they take into, into consideration for their gross national happiness index. But then there's, there's the UN study, I think they do it every year or every two years to, to keep track. There's obviously the, the the annual World Happiness Index, um, where the U.S. hasn't been doing that well lately. Um, so, so you know, there's a subjective aspect to it, and there's a or, or a subjective measure. There's a more you know so-called objective measure to happiness. Right. Um, but I think more and more, I'm noticing that our instant gratification culture seems to be making us more and more miserable. It's, it's um, I want it now, I want it here. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a very short term uh, orientation. So, so, um, so I've come to believe that the best definition of happiness is, and again, this may be a cliche to some, but, but the journey is just as valuable. As, as, oh yeah, or just as just as fulfilling and satisfying as the destination or the outcome. Right? So the Dalai Lama would say, 
that happiness is practice. We spoke about practice. Yeah. You practice happiness. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not an end goal. It's, it's not some abstract ideal you know, for a country or for the world. It's, you, you can practice happiness. You can practice, the, you know, and how do you practice happiness? By being less attached, you know, less, you do a little bit less clinging to stuff. So it can be material stuff, but it can also be your ideas. You know, it's like if, if things don't play out exactly the way we imagine, oh, all hell breaks loose. No, there's always the next time, right? So, so, so it is a practice. I mean, you mentioned Viktor Frankl. I, I thought that was very, um, we're, I think we're, we're connected there because um, I'm a huge fan of his work. And, mm -hmm. and him as, as, a, as a person, I think his contribution was amazing, you know. Um, and um, yeah, I think, I mean, he was, he was in a concentration camp for years. I know. If, if you can have any excuse to be unhappy, that would make it, right? That would be a really good excuse to be. I mean, unhappy is a. You feel very unhappy, right? You feel absolutely miserable. And he discovered that. I mean, of course, and I'm not denying that there's external factors. I mean, we have all these, um, we have stressors in our environments that, that affect us. There's, there's no way of denying that. But I think his story is, is amazing because, again, the, the stressors in his environment were some of the most extreme that have ever exi existed for any human being. And yet, out of that, you know, emerged the concept, the concept of, of logotherapy and, and the search for meaning, mm -hmm. or the will to meaning, right, that he called it. Right. That's, I think, I think there's, there's a lesson there. Yeah, a big one. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, here's a little more vulnerable question. What is the most embarrassing moment you've had as a coach? Yeah, well, there's 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 one that's still speaking of remembering self. There's there's one that I remember very very clearly. That's still I'm still I'm still uh, digesting. I think <laughs> it happened a couple of years ago. I was actually doing a a workshop for an organization, one of my clients, and and it there were about fifty people in the room. It was a so it was a fairly big group, and this is a client that I had already been working with. So there was a well, the person who invited me to do the workshop was someone who I had been working with. So there was already a relationship, and there was a good level of trust, and um, and I became so. I felt such a huge sense of responsibility. And at the same time, I felt I was so passionate about the topic that I, that I had to, that I was invited to talk about. And it was gonna be about a four hour workshop. And so I got into the mindset of preparing really, 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 really well. And it, I, I completely lose, I lost sight of what the workshop should have really been about, which was, you know, making it as participatory as possible and making it as practical as possible. I was talking to a bunch of engineers, most of them. Um, so I, 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 I don't know what, I'm, I still, I'm still not sure what happened. But my desire to make an amazing presentation and to deliver a lot of content and to have the most beautiful slides in the world 
just totally it just over, like it totally took over right and I'm not gonna say it was well yes I am I'm gonna say it. from from my vantage point and from some of the feedback that I got or even the lack of feedback <laughs> The silence that I got, the silence <laughs> that I got afterwards, I could tell it was a total train wreck. It had been a total train train wreck, uh, and it's it was hard. It, it was it, it it had a yeah. I, I I was extremely depressed and ashamed, and um, yeah, and I I could sense that some of that trust had been broken, right? And, um, and, and the crazy thing was that I, I could easily imagine how I could have designed the workshop in a different way, because I could have, right? And I had, I mean, I had, I, I knew how, I mean, I know how to do that, right? So why I didn't do it and I did something else, <laughs> <laughs> I've been there well, before. Almost like I wanted to sat satisfy myself. <laughs> yeah, it's like you get this bringing, brain fart. Bringing something to the audience, right? It's, and then, yeah, I think we cut it short, like to three hours instead of four hours, because, you know, like people were, some people were falling asleep. And it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> we all have those. We all have those. Um, well, thank you for sharing that, Christian. I appreciate it. Um, we've talked about a lot of different stuff. Is there anything else that you think would be good for a potential client or other providers in general to know about you? Mm. I can't think of anything, really. Um, I think uh, if people want to contact me, they can do so through the website. Um, it's um, S-C-Y-R-O-C-C-O, Hiroko.com. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm open for business. I'm open to listening. I'm open to getting to know people and supporting them on their journey. So that's it. Cool. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Christian. It's been a pleasure. Noah. thank you so much. Uh, I really like what you're doing with your podcast and, and uh, yeah, keep going. Thanks. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to Next Quest Podcast. I learned something new today, and I hope you did too. Next week's episode will feature Sarah Karens, licensed psychologist who will be speaking about her practice and area of specialty, EMDR. Next Quest Podcast is sponsored by Jan Dimmitt Resources. Save yourself the time and stress of credentialing and let the experts at Jan Dimmitt Resources do what they do best. For over 20 years, Jan Dimmitt Resources has provided administrative support and credentialing services to mental health professionals in Texas and beyond. Visit their website at jandimmitt.com. That is J A N D I M M I T T dot com or call 512 731 5725 for more information on all the ways they can make running your practice easier for you. Next Quest Podcasts relies solely on donations to keep this project going. Please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page at www.patreon, that's P A T R E O N dot com slash Next Quest Podcast, or you can make a one time donation on my website at www.nextquestcounseling.com slash About Next Quest Podcast. 
You can also support the podcast by liking our Facebook page. Until next question, this is Noah Garcia signing off.